Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today for that conference in the cloud for the Perl and Oracle community. This is my pleasure to introduce you Graham Hollis, which is a prominent author in the Perl community. Graham is the, the author of many alien modules, but also many more distribution, including the modern and promising FFI. Today, Graham is going to talk uh, in this 50 minute session about Perl and WebAssembly. So Graham, you got the mic. Thank you. So as, uh, as was introduced uh, today, I want to talk to you about Perl and WebAssembly. My name is Graham Wallace. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Fastly uh, on the internet. Uh, many people know me as Pisces, so you can contact me that way if you have any questions later on. In my spare time, I work on a number of uh, Perl related open source projects. Uh, there are two that you may have heard of, uh, possibly you've even used. Uh, the first is the alien family of modules under the alien build banner. These let you declare external non CPAN dependencies for your Perl projects. And the Platypus project, which is an alternative form function interface for Perl. Platypus has some advantages over Perl's native form function interface, known as XS especially when you're writing library bindings and do not need to extend the Perl language, uh, programming language itself. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Platypus in this talk because it is a related, although different technology. Today though, as I say, I wanna to talk to you about WebAssembly or WASM for short. It's a fast, safe, portable bytecode that can be used by web browsers in performance critical situations where JavaScript is not fast enough. I think the, one of the keys to uh, WebAssembly success is that it works uh, well with a number of existing technologies and tool chains. For example, in a traditional Unix environment, you'd use a C compiler like Clang to compile C code into an object file, which then can be linked into an executable or a library, which you can run from the bash prompt or call from another program. Uh, again, for example, you can call a dynamic li library from Perl using Platypus. It turns out that uh, modern Clang also supports WebAssembly as a backend. So you can take the, use the same sort of uh, pipeline uh, and instead link with the WASM linker and get a WebAssembly binary file. The same format is used for both programs and libraries. A program is actually, uh, it's just a, a WASM file that happens to have a start function. So we can run WebAssembly programs using a uh, command line uh, runtime, or we can call it uh, using JavaScript inside of a web browser. And the nice thing is you don't have to be a whiz at C either, uh, because there are some more modern languages like Rust or Go that are supported, uh, that support WebAssembly as a backend. Uh, a lot of WebAssembly and the infrastructure used to build and run it are actually written in Rust, as it turns out. So there's lots of interesting technology. But why you're asking uh, WebAssembly and not JavaScript? Well, for CPU-bound tasks, it's much faster and uh, even approaches the speed of natively compiled code. For another reason, you can develop your web application in a mature compiled language like Rust or C. Uh, and you can exploit the knowledge that your developers might have in those technologies. Finally, WebAssembly lets you sandbox part of your application so that it, you won't accidentally or intentionally in the case of malicious intent, take down the end user system. Uh, also, uh, WebAssemblies for this reason actually are very easy to introspect since the WebAssembly runtime has to know a lot of detail about exactly what gets passed between the guest and the host, uh, it means that uh, you can introspect and understand uh, how the module works quite easily through APIs. I just wanna show you a couple of demos. Uh, the first is, uh, program that I wrote in the 90s uh, it's a hex editor for DOS. Uh, I thought I was being pretty clever uh, calling it hexed. It turns out that everyone else was being exactly as clever and called it the exact same thing. Uh, 
uh, but we've got like a file browser here. We can open our open ourselves. We're opening hexed with hexed, and we can sort of scroll through horizontally. At some point, I thought this was like wasting a lot of real estate on the help. So I came up with a different view mode, which you can see in uh, bits and hex and all kinds of things. So yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it was my thing that I did in the nineties. Uh, this program was written in um, Turbo Pascal, which I loved back in the day. It was uh, exciting to learn this morning that we're finally going to beloved surpass my beloved Turbo Pascal uh, as Perl makes its way to version eight eventually. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. On modern hardware, this utility only works in an emulator like DOSBox. And somebody has happily boarded, ported DOSBox to WebAssembly and called it JS-DOS. Uh, appropriately enough, uh, it's version 6.22. Uh, which uh, I, if most of you, many of you may remember, I don't know, I think most Perl programmers are probably old enough uh, to remember that uh, 622 was the last version of DOS. Uh, uh, and originally uh, I was gonna use this uh, example DOSBox to show you one of the games that I wrote in the 90s, because that's usually what you use DOSBox for. Uh, but uh, to be honest, it was a little unimpressive and I had trouble getting the sound to work right. But you get the kind of the idea. You can, you know, uh, bring old things back to life with some of this technology. And much better and more resource intensive games can be run in the browser using the same technology. For example, uh, I saw a demo of Doom 3 uh, ported to WebAssembly. Uh, that was running really well. And that's, I know it's like 10 years old now, but that's pretty impressive 3D and sound for running in a browser tab. Oh, let's close this window. So the next demo I wanted to show you, this one I can't take any credit for, somebody else did this, but I think it shows you some real-time capability. Hopefully this will work. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a, uh, this is using my camera and we can apply filters using uh, WebAssembly to the picture. And this is, so this is all, and since this is the camera and you can see that this is happening right now, I can, you can see that it's happening in real time. And uh, hopefully you can see this too over Zoom, but it's quite, it's quite spry. It's, it's, it's pretty fast, so. It's a, it's a pretty cool demo that somebody wrote, I think. Let me go to the next thing. Okay. Good. Finally, my buttons are getting a bit slow, I'm sorry. One example of uh, okay, let's try again. One example of using WebAssembly in the browser is Perl itself. The Web Perl project has the goal of allowing developers to run Perl in the browser. Since Perl itself is a C program, the Web Perl project has ported Perl to the particular flavor of C used by the compiler in the browsers, uh, and they've added some hooks to make it work in the browser's environment in a useful kind of way. So. Here's a demo. We've got uh, a Perl program and we can run it. And it prints out a message that is displayed in the text area to the right. Nice. Well, it's pretty simple. You can also call Perl from JavaScript. Uh, so this program, it evaluates a Perl program which also prints a message. So we run that and it prints the other message. So, but I think the useful uh, thing about this is that it has full access to the document object model. So we can actually query the, the, the DOM for the document title, for example, and print that out instead. So Perl plus WebAssembly, that's the, uh, the title. 
of this talk. WebAssembly can also be useful in server and command line applications where the sandbox nature of the technology allows running untrusted code that could misbehave. This works and can be relatively safe, assuming you set the appropriate resource limits. For example, at Fastly, uh, which is a content delivery network, we allow customers to provide their own WebAssembly applications that are run on our cache nodes. This allows our customers to more quickly uh, respond to their customers, in some cases without having to go back to their backend servers at all. Uh, and since the code is run in a WebAssembly sandbox, we don't have to worry about one of our customers taking down the crash node or accessing other customers' data. Uh, previously, customers uh, could use, and in fact still do, use a domain-specific language called VCL to write their own custom logic at the edge. But the ability to uh, use a general purpose programming language like C, Rust, or Go, uh, and their well-known tool chains gives the, our customers a lot more flexibility and power. And of course, being a pro programmer, uh, I'm interested in using WebAssembly from Perl. Uh, the same tools uh, that can be used to create a WebAssembly binary for use in uh, Perl uh, can be used that we earlier used to uh, build browser-based applications. In the pursuit of this goal, I've written some modules to allow me to do exactly that. Wasm Wasm Time uh, is a low-level library that lets you introspect and call WebAssembly code. It's uh, sort of low-level bindings on um, something called WASM time, which I'll talk about in a minute. WASM PM is a higher level of interface that makes it easy to call between Perl and WebAssembly without having to know a lot about how WebAssembly works. And finally, PLASM or Perl WASM uh, is a tool for poking around with and running WebAssembly binaries from the command line. Wasm time, as I say, is a popular Rust library that implements uh, WebAssembly, implements a WebAssembly runtime. Helpfully, uh, Wasm time it has a very FFI friendly C API, which means it can be uh, pretty easily embedded in just about any modern programming language. Remember again from before that Platypus is an FFI for Perl. So, I, of course, uh, wrote Wasm Wasm time using Platypus. And I just want to show you this diagram. It's, it shows the most important classes to understand uh, how Wasm time works. Uh, the module object on the left is a compiled in memory representation of a WebAssembly binary. Uh, the module object can contain a number of name to func type mappings. A func type is just a function signature, basically. So this tells me, uh, tells us what functions we can call and how to call them. The, the module object also contains another useful object, which is the memory type. Uh, this tells us the maximum and minimum number of pages of memory that the WebAssembly requires. Um, the WebAssembly instance object can be created from a module object. And this is what we use to actually call the func types, which are the functions inside the WebAssembly. Um, and we also have the memory object, which gives us a data pointer, which is just a, a, a data pointer and a size to the memory region used by the WebAssembly module instance. Uh, and it's important to um, maybe, but hopefully obvious that uh, although Perl can access WebAssembly's memory. The opposite isn't true. Uh, WebAssembly can't peek out of its own uh, memory region. And that's for the sandboxing that we were talking about before. Wasm time also has a number of utility functions. Wap to Wasm, for example, translates WebAssembly text, the textual representation, into WebAssembly binary, which is what you need to actually uh, use WebAssembly. And this 
little example, here we're converting the simplest possible WebAssembly module, one that doesn't do anything uh, and doesn't have any memory, uh, into WebAssembly binary. I'd also like to mention the WASM-time linker, which is a runtime linker that makes it easy for two or more WebAssembly modules to call each other. Uh, I don't have any examples for that because it's a bit complicated, but the higher level WASM PM interface uses this to offload much of its work of linking different uh, modules together. Let's look at some call code that calls WebAssembly from Perl. The WebAssembly text is passed into the module constructor. Under the co covers, WAP to WASM, which we saw earlier, is called. Passing the WebAssembly text is helpful in examples like this or when you're experimenting with WebAssembly. In production, you'd likely want to use WebAssembly binary here, which you can pass in directly or by providing a file name. This particular module has just one function. It adds two integers together. Uh, and once we have the module object, we can instantiate it by creating uh, a WebAssembly, uh, an instance, sorry, a WASM time instance object. We can query the instance object to get the add function. And now we can finally call it. We pass in the values one and two, and three is returned, which is what you would expect. And if you don't want to muck out around with func objects, uh, because if you're, if you're building an interface, that's not exactly the kind of thing that you want to give people to use, uh, then you can attach them and call them exactly like regular Perl subroutines. So instead of calling the object, we attach it, we create a Perl subroutine, and now we can use it. And when you're using it, you don't even have to know that it's WebAssembly, that it's anything other than just calling the Perl sub. You can also call WebAssembly from Perl. Again, we provide the WebAssembly text in line here. This module has just two functions. One is imported from Perl called hello. The other is exported from the module and called run. Next, we create a wasmtime func object for our Perl callback. When we instantiate, or, sorry, when we create the instance object this time, we have to provide a callback. In this case, we have just uh, one import, but if you have more than one import, you'd have to provide them in the same order that they're declared into the web assembly. So the interface doesn't use the names, it's just using the order of the imports. Finally, we can call the WebAssembly run function, which calls back into Perl space, uh, calling the, ca the callback, which then finally prints out hello world. So now we can go both ways. We can go from Perl to WASM, WASM to Perl. Uh, that's, sorry, that's a lot of work. Um, and most of the time you don't, you don't want or need to care about that level of introspection. Uh, and that's what WASMPM is for. WASMPM doesn't expose the WASM time interface at all. Uh, and that's an intentional design decision that I made just in case uh, we decide to change the lower level implementation later. It makes it much easier to do that. Um, at the moment, I prefer the WASM time to, to do this module, uh, but there are similar projects like WASMR that might make sense down the line. It might even make sense to support multiple implementations and decide at runtime which ones to use. So in this example, again, uh, we provide the WebAssembly inline uh, as text, but you could provide a binary or an external file instead. Uh, as a convenience, uh, we use the exporter option to have all the exported functions automatically thrown into the calling module. Uh, we could also say OK here instead and have them imported on request. Um, under the covers, the Perl exporter module is used to do the actual work. Uh, and I think this is a, a kind of a neat detail. Uh, you know, wherever possible, I tried to uh, make WASMPM use existing Perlish interfaces. Now we can use our math stuff module just like any other Perl module. 
as a user, you don't have to know or care what language, binary format, whatever is being used under the covers. This could easily be an XS module, it could be FFI, it could be Pure Pro, who knows? It just happens to be web, WebAssembly. You can still call Perl from WebAssembly using the WASMPM interface. Uh, here, we just define a Perl subroutine. This time, we don't have to even wrap it in a func object. Uh, the WebAssembly asks to import hello from main, the main package. Notice that the WebAssembly code doesn't need to know or care what language hello function is implemented in. And finally, we call the run uh, the WebAssembly run function, which calls the Perl Hubble subroutine, which prints out our message. And the, the, the magic happens by the use WASM statement. It exports the, uh, the exported functions from the WebAssembly into the calling package. Honestly, though, uh, even this is like way too much work. Uh, with WASM hook, we can reduce the boilerplate even further. Uh, here, oops. Here we write some WebAssembly text into a text into a file that will implement our module, and this is the same module that we saw before. Uh, but with the right tools, this could be C, Rust, or Go. It could be anything that's supported. We use the wat to wasm command line tool, which is similar to the API that I showed you before, but on the command line, to convert the WebAssembly text into WebAssembly binary and place it where you would normally expect to see a .pm file if this were a pure Perl module. But we don't need the PM file because wasm hook installs an at ink hook to find the WebAssembly binary files and generates the necessary boilerplate for us. And the nice thing here is now we can take this WebAssembly binary module and use it on any platform that support, is supported by WASMPM. You no longer have to worry about you know, weird compiler options on obscure dialects of Unix. Uh, you've compiled it once, you can use it everywhere. Uh, and you get some of the benefits of a pure Perl module in that respect, but also some of the performance benefits of using XS or FFI. In fact, we can use this exact same binary WebAssembly file in other languages as well. Python has a WASM time loader interface that lets us use the exact same module from Python without recompiling anything. You can also do the same thing with Node.js. Since the WASM time module class has all the information that we need to know in order to find and call WebAssembly functions inside the modules, it should be easy to reuse this module in any language that has sufficiently advanced WASM time bindings. Plasm or the Perl WASM is a command line tool for WebAssembly binaries. Let's use this very simple C program that prints out a greeting and command line arguments that are passed to it as an example. We can compile the C into a WebAssembly binary and run it with plasm run subcommand. It works exactly when we run it this way as if it were a native C program. It prints out the message, and for each argument that we pass in, it prints those out as well. We can also use the plasm dump subcommand to print out the interface of the WebAssembly binary. So this is. Uh, it looks like just a re regular WebAssembly text, but it's just the, the imports and the outputs. It doesn't have the implementation of any of the functions. So it's, it's similar to looking at a, a header file from C. Uh, as you might expect, this, there's a start function, which is what makes this a program and that, not just a library. There's also a memory export, so the host language can interact with WebAssembly's linear memory region. This program also has a number of functions that look like they might work with the operating system. And in this case, you'd be right. Uh, prop exit impl implements uh, exit functionality. There are a couple of argument processing functions that lets the program get the command line arguments. 
And finally, there are a number of functions with the FD prefix that do IO. As an aside, if we have a less complicated program, one that doesn't query the command line or do IO, for example, we get a much shorter list of imports. That's because uh, WebAssembly only generates code interface, code and interfaces for objects that get used by the module. This is very helpful since you don't want to ship an entire libc with a web to a web browser if you're only just going to use bits and pieces of it. Uh, all the sorts of functions that we've been uh, looking at are imported from a module called WASI Snapshot Preview One. And what's that? Well. The WebAssembly system interface, or WASI, is a simple ABI and API designed by Mozilla. Excuse me. WASI is portable to any platform, pretty much. It provides POSIX features like file IO, which can be configured for the security conscious by the WebAssembly runtime. So how do we do that from Perl? WASM time comes with a default WASI that can be configured or for your security needs. WASMPM by default gives full access to the local system, though uh, I plan on adding an isolation option. This will allow specific modules to be isolated from other WebAssembly modules, from Perl, or from the operating system. If you're using the lower level WASM WASM time interface, you can uh, already grant specific access to specific resources when creating the WASM instance. For example, uh, here we're using uh, a hash to set the environment instead of using the system environment. We can redirect the input and output strip, sorry, well, in this case, I'm doing the output streams, but you can also redirect the input streams standard to files on disk. You can map the guest root file system to a particular uh, folder or directory on the host. And once we sort of built this configuration object, we can create the, inst the WASI instance that can be used with the WASM time linker. We could also implement uh, WASI in Perl. If we wanted to have a virtual file system backed by a network, or if you wanted to pull command line options from a database, or, uh, there are a lot of different possibilities um, if, you, if you do this. So XS, FFI, and WASM uh, are all different types of foreign function interfaces, each with their benefits and, and challenges. Uh, XS is native to Perl, which means that it is available everywhere that Perl is and is great at extending the Perl programming language itself. Uh, on sort of the less positive side, it's a bit esoteric and uh, quite a bit different from the way that most programming languages tend to be extended. So once you've learned uh, XS, it's not really as applicable to other environments. Uh, it can be extremely tedious to write Perl bindings for APIs with lots of functions. The full XS API, if you can call it an API, uh, is quite complicated and it has a very steep learning curve. Uh, and even experienced XS programmers find that there are lots of sharp edges and gotchas. There's lots of documentation for XS. Uh, this, for example, is the XS Perl man page. Um, everyone, actually, please read this. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a few minutes. OK, everybody got that? OK, good. After reading this uh, and Perl Guts and Perl API, which are both even longer, uh, you're starting to be proficient in XS. Platypus, Platypus, in contrast, is available on all modern Perl platforms, probably any that you are likely to use in practice. Uh, I know OpenBMS isn't supported, for example. I find that FFI bindings are uh, fairly easy to port from one language to another. Uh, I have frequently borrowed FFI bindings from Ruby for use in Perl. The Ruby uh, folks really love FFI, so that's cool. Uh, 
WASM, WASM time itself was heavily influenced by the already existing Python bindings for the same library. Unfortunately, like XS, it can be very tedious to write curl bindings for APIs with lots of functions. And although the goal of, Platypus, of the Platypus project is uh, to be language neutral as much as possible, most libraries that you're likely to write bindings for have a C interface. And C is honestly terrible at introspection. Uh, this means that it's a challenge to automate bindings, uh, binding generators. libclang, which is an API to the clang parser, could potentially reduce the tedium of writing FFI bindings by parsing a C header file for type and function declarations. Still, most C libraries are gonna require at least some human intervention to implement correctly. And let me give you a sense of why by looking at this phone header file. So first of all, constants are defined typically using the C preprocessor which means the compiler uh, and libclang, for that matter, don't even see them. This means that uh, if you want to introspect for constants, you can't use libclang. Instead, you have to use another tool, like the C preprocessor itself. Uh, constants could also be defined using enums, uh, which would be possible using something like libclang, but there are other gotchas there. Now, for a simple function that takes basic non-pointer or non-array types, you're pretty much golden. Uh, there aren't many ways that you can interpret this add function. There's not many ways it could be called. Likewise, this print string function is pretty clear. A const char star is usually a null terminated string, although technically it could be a pointer to a single byte. You just There's no way to know with certainty. This process list function uh, obviously takes a, uh, a list of structs, and you can tell that from the name. But if you're an automated tool, you can't make that assumption because uh, it's not obvious. For WASM time, the good news is that most common CPUs and platforms are supported Intel and ARM, Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Unfortunately, if you're on 32 bit, uh, and I don't think that many people still are. Um, or if you're on a less common operating system, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, at least for now, these platforms may be supported in the future. On the other hand, modern languages are supported quite well for both hosts and guests. Another plus is that these languages have robust, fairly mature tool chains. And there are a lot of experienced developers out there who know how to ex exploit them. As we showed with the WASI interface, WebAssembly can access the file system, or at least some file system that might be virtualized. It doesn't typically have direct access to the network, at least not in the current implementations, uh, unless you provide those bindings yourself. This means that things like SQLite or ImageMagick should be pretty easy to port to WebAssembly. But something like libcurl would be quite difficult. The really great thing about WebAssembly is that the bindings themselves are almost effortless. Uh, I showed before that thanks to the security needs of WebAssembly, introspection is quite good. Unfortunately, uh, only basic numbers are supported. Uh, strings, arrays, and nested data types uh, typically require peeking into WebAssembly's linear memory region and having some knowledge of the way the guest language stores its data structures. Um, at least we do have access to the memory region, though. So I want to show you quickly, as possible. Here's an example of how you would write some bindings to a library that takes uh, strings as input and output. First, we need to tell the C compiler which symbols uh, should be exported using this peculiar incantation. Next, we write a wrapper around malloc and free so that we can allocate and free memory from curl space. Now we can implement our actual function. Uh, this is a function that takes a subject and returns a greeting to that subject. We compute the length of the output string, allocate the memory, 
create the greeting from a template using Sprint app, and finally return it. We're not even close to being done yet, though. Uh, there's still some Perl code that needs to be written. Uh, this little incantation creates a function C string that converts a null terminated string, which is what C uses, to a Perl string. And we'll need that in a minute. We have to allocate space for the input string in the web WebAssembly's memory. Copy our Perl string into WebAssembly memory. Call the WebAssembly greet function. This returns an offset to our output function. Convert uh, the offset, convert the string in WebAssembly memory using the memory address and the offset to a Perl string. Deallocate the input and output uh, strings in WebAssembly. And finally, we can return our Perl string. And we can finally call our WebAssembly that works with strings from Perl. The next trick I want to show you is calling a Perl subroutine that takes uh, a string from WebAssembly. The thing that this callback needs to know is which memory region to read from, since uh, there could be multiple WebAssembly modules in your program. This is exactly the sort of thing that you need to deal with, by the way, if you're writing a WASI implementation, as I was describing earlier in Perl, because a lot of the WASI functionality requires reading and writing from and to the caller's memory region. To get that contextual information, we're going to import the WASM caller memory function. This is somewhat inspired by the Perl caller function. They both give us information about who is calling us in the current context. Next, we write a function to print the WASM string. Since we can only pass numbers, we pass in a memory offset. We call the WASM caller function, memory function, which returns the memory region that we need. Uh, if the, sorry. If the subroutine happens to be called from Perl, by the way, this will return undead. We can uh, now convert the offset in the memory address to a Perl string and print it out. Uh, from the WebAssembly side, we import the uh, print wasm string function from the main package using the appropriate function signature. Uh, we use the WebAssembly data segment to store the string into. Alternatively, if this were a C program, this might be dynamically allocated. Uh, but this, for this example, it's, it makes it easy. Finally, we can write uh, our function, which calls the piece of the Perl subroutine. So after dealing with numbers, uh, uh, working and, and those working so easily, the complexity of working with strings just kind of makes me want to cry a little bit, uh, especially in Perl, you know, uh, where we're kind of, you know, working with strings is kind of our thing. There is hope though. WebAssembly interface types promise to address a lot of this. Interface types provide an extra layer inside Web, in the WebAssembly binary that tell the host how to translate complicated types like strings. The current proposal uh, converts things lazily and avoids copies where possible. So it should be possible to implement this fairly efficiently. Uh, in fact, an earlier uh, prototype of interface types was actually included in an earlier version of WASM type, but they removed it because the implementation and the proposal were diverging. Um, and this, I, this was disappointing to be sure, <laughs> uh, but I think it was the, the good thing to do in the long run. I think they'll be implementing it right rather than, than quickly. And all of this works because most languages store strings in more or less the same way in linear memory. Uh, objects can be stored as pointers. Um, array, arrays and structured data should also be fairly doable. Uh, with interface types, it should be possible to drop the explicit memory allocation wrappers and greet.pm 
altogether and go back to calling the WebAssembly from Perl directly, or at least directly from my perspective. I don't have to worry that it's going through uh, uh, the hook interface. Another challenge to the current implementation of my WASM time bindings is that the method used to call and attach WebAssembly's functions is probably somewhat suboptimal. This is a hotspot that we could pretty easily make faster. Uh, this is a hotspot we could uh, make uh, faster, I think. Uh, and I think we'd get a big benefit from it. And I say this from experience working with FFI and Perl. FFI Raw, for example, was the only real FFI game in town before Platypus came along. I know it pretty well because I wrote some libarchive bindings using it in order to teach myself FFI, to be honest. Uh, and I also made a lot of PRs to FFI Raw based on my experience using it. What I learned from that process, I used when designing Platypus. Anyway, uh, FFI Raw lets you uh, construct an object for each C function that you want to call. Uh, and then you can call the function using the object's call method. That seems okay, right? I mean, uh, seems like the obvious way to do it. Except method calls are relatively slow because at compile time, we don't know what class the object belongs to and therefore which exact function needs to be executed. We have to instead compute all that runtime, which is kind of sad because you basically never need to subclass FFI raw. You're paying the penalty for all FFI functions for no reason. Platypus took a different approach. To start with, the main object represents the library that you're calling into and not the function. You typically only need to use it when you're building your interface, when the overhead of method calls is fairly acceptable. You still have the option of creating a function object. The flexibility here comes at a performance cost, but the killer feature of Platypus is that you can attach a function as an X sub and you get the performance, which is fairly close to XS. The key to all this working is the any pointer, which hangs off of an X sub. Normally this is null, but we can put anything that we want there. Uh, in the case of Platypus, uh, we put the metadata that libffi needs in order to make the underlying C function call. I didn't come up with this technique, by the way. Uh, Bulk88 showed me how to do this. Um, he was using the same technique in an FFI called Win32 API. Uh, I need to be able to use it, do FFI things on non-Windows platforms though, which is why we have Platypus today. What makes things sense here, I think, is to write, in the case of WASM, is to write some excess implementation to, for the call and attach functionality of the func objects. We can use the same any pointer technique to make attached functions quite fast. There really isn't any benefit, I think, to rewriting the entire API in excess. Uh, I think it, it probably just make it harder to maintain. Um, this is exactly what excess is good for though, which is extending the Perl programming language itself. The module should optionally be installed when the compiler isn't, uh, sorry, the module should be optionally installed when the compiler is available uh, and we should fall back on the FFI implementation when it isn't. Another interesting piece of tech that I just want to mention is Lucid. Uh, it's a compiler that we developed in-house at Fastly uh, and is now open sourced. Lucid is a native WebAssembly compiler and runtime. Uh, Lucid ahead of time compiles WebAssembly into native 64-bit Intel binaries. Uh, for even better performance. At the same time, Lucid binaries have the same sand sandbox safety as a regular WebAssembly runtime. So it's safe to run untrusted WebAssembly inside your per application provided that you configure it with the appropriate limits. So this is the same diagram. I've been showing this diagram a lot today, uh, except for now someone has to, and it doesn't have to be you, compile a program into WebAssembly. And then once you get it, you can convert it into a dynamic library using Lucid. The resulting dynamic library can 
uh, be run using the Lucid runtime or from another program, uh, programming language. There aren't any Perl bindings for the, any of this at the moment, but this tech might be useful, uh, might have useful applications in the future. So that's all I have for today. If you're interested in WebAssembly, you should definitely come join us on the IRC native channel uh, or the Perl WASM GitHub organization. Um, I've discussed, I think, uh, some areas where my WebAssembly modules uh, have some limitations. Uh, I think addressing some of those limitations could make interesting projects for those who are interested in the tech. Uh, I, and I welcome collaborations to that end. Uh, the native channel, just as an aside, is also uh, a good place to discuss Alien and Platypus if those technologies sound interesting. Uh, and with that, I will say, does anybody have any questions? I cannot see any raise on at this time. If you have questions, raise your on in Zoom, please. Mike. Go for it. Hello? Yeah. So, oh. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm wondering, uh, you, you keep on mentioning Fastly, and I, uh, I, I'm i wondering, are you guys, um, is this stuff that you guys are using in production already? I know that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of competing ideas on the production readiness of WebAssembly and, and things like this, um, at least in the circles that I've been around. So I'm, I'm curious to know. Uh, your your assessment of production readiness uh, and you seeing this stuff in the wild. So we are using this. This is a closed beta at the moment that some of our users are actually using this at the moment. Uh, so, but the the, um, the idea is to get this out fairly fairly quickly. So you guys already have some of this in front of customers and they're looking at it already. That's correct. That's cool. That's very exciting. Anybody else? We have Hello? another question. Yeah, Maurice. I have a question. This is a very uh, tangential question, but I'm just curious. The syntax for WebAssembly looked awfully Lispish. Uh, was WebAssembly originally done by Lisp type people? Uh, it does look very Lispish. I'm not actually, I, but I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Uh. But I, I did notice that as well. Mm. OK, thank you. It was a nice talk. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? Andrew. That was cool. Was there a question? Thank you. I do not see any more questions. Uh, so I guess you can continue the discussion online if you do not have more. Oh, there was one. Sounds oh. good. Thank you, everybody, for yeah. attending. And uh, definitely uh, let me know on the appropriate channels if you have questions or are interested in working on this stuff. And what's the best roadmap to get started? Um, I mean, I would. I would uh, install it and try running some programs, look at the documentation, uh, show up on the IRC. Uh, I try to be pretty friendly there. 